Hey guys, this video is brought to you by Linode. If you guys are looking to get into web hosting, you want to have your project out there, I recommend Linode. I've been using them for eight years now. So on this particular Linode account that I have, I'm only paying $20 a month and I literally have thousands of people going to this website every week. And uh, it's actually several websites, but that's just, um, there's one main website, several thousand people, cost me less than $20 a month. Azure AWS doesn't compare. Hey guys, what's up? So this video is going to be a rundown of everything that you need to learn and master in order to consider yourself a CSS master, at least in my opinion, in 2020. So cascading style sheets is what I'm talking about, commonly known as CSS. This is what actually paints the web. So I'm sure a lot of you guys, anybody that's done any web development knows about it. But it's essentially the painting, the markup, the layouts of your user interface in the web that exists inside web browsers, which are pretty much exists across all different sort of platforms these days. So what do you have to learn, though, in order to become a CSS expert? So I think, number one, it's going to start off with your basic syntax, your basic style options, the things that we've been using since like uh, 25 five years ago, some of the, like, the most beginning features of CSS, the, the, that's just the basic syntax, the markup. It's things like margins, paddings, font size. And also, when I mention the basics, I'm talking about the images as well. CSS can load images. It can also load other CSS files. So you can see this website here actually has inline styling. That's another thing that you have to understand about CSS is how CSS is actually loaded and rendered. So basically, you can see on this Tiavana website that it has inline styling. And this inline styling is typically frowned upon if you're writing your CSS this way because it's it's so statically like hard coded and you can't reuse these styles over and over again. So you can see that, they're, that you know it's a lot of text and things you have to transfer across the wire. I think it's interesting a company that's owned by Starbucks is actually writing their stuff this way. But then again, you know, whatever works, works, right? But um, some people would probably frown upon this inline styling, but that's one way of doing CSS. You could also load CSS files. So if I refresh this page and I filter in on my CSS, you can see all these different CSS files that are actually being loaded. And the order in which they're loaded is telling the browser how to render it. So if something is loaded first and then something gets loaded after, whatever's loaded after can easily overwrite the first. Now, in addition to that, it, it, like similar to mathematics where you have like things like operator precedence where multiplication has a higher precedence than addition or subtraction the same thing applies with css and what that is referred to in css is specificity so specificity is actually all the different css rules and there's all kinds of different ones that determine what is going to have more specificity over another rule so you can see here they're actually using media queries and in addition to that they're chaining together um they're using specificity to just really just target down onto this one div element that is a um that is a child and you can see because of the space between this class and this class here that this is referring to the specificity of the child element so the child element, whatever it may be, it could be a div tag, a span, whatever, but whatever it is that contains the class T bottle container, it's going to be a child element of category page. And that could be also whatever element um, as well. So if there were no space though, that's how you chain together two different styles um, to the same element. So if you want to use specificity to say, I only want to target an element that has both of these classes, then you would do it this way without the space. So learning those specificity rules in CSS is absolutely imperative. And we're sort of going in no order at all. But since I mentioned the media query, if I were to turn on the um, responsive toggle here, I can actually switch down between all the different popular cell phones and see what the website looks like. And I can also put in responsive mode and really just um, have full access, but you can see the way the, the UI is reshaping. Let me make this a little bit um, smaller. You can see the way that the, the UI is reshaping here, so it's going to look pretty good on a cell phone of this size. This responsive nature is all being done via media queries, so it uses these media queries to, if I were to look at an element here, um, here's a media query here, so you can see that these classes are being targeted uh, to something 
that is at least 768 pixels wide. So understanding media queries and why we do that in CSS, it's all about maintaining one code source that just simply adapts to whatever physical uh, device is, is viewing it based on its width. Uh, the next thing I think that we need to focus on with CSS, especially for um, beginner people, is how to use the debugging tools within Chrome. And one of those things is source maps. And you don't have to use Chrome, by the way. Uh, Mozilla is also a great browser. I have a, a video where I feature both of them. And each one of them has their plus and minuses. So the, I, I actually use both of them together. So another thing to keep in mind with CSS also is pseudo classes. That's something we've had for a long time now. But basic elements like your, your buttons or your anchor tags, meaning your, uh, your links, when you hover over them, does the style change? Does the color change? Whatever it is, that's actually called a pseudo class. But in addition to pseudo classes, there's also a pseudo element. All right, so the next thing I would think with CSS and mastering it, these days it's all about the uh, Flexbox. So not just Flexbox, but also CSS Grid. They sound similar. I look at it like I use Flexbox for most things, but if I have some sort of very, very dynamic tabular type of data, then I think the grid gives you a little bit more power for very flexible dynamic data presentation type stuff. Whereas Flexbox, I find it to be just a little bit easier for your basic UI uh, layout. We used to have to do something with CSS floats, and we'd have to do things called like floats and clears. And you can see that uh, W3Schools even has a, a page dedicated to that. But luckily, we don't have to do this type of stuff as much anymore because this becomes a lot more difficult to debug when, like, this image right here is floated to the left so this content automatically pulls up and wraps to the left. And I think that makes a lot of sense for a lot of people that have been doing this for a long time. But once you start doing it the Flexbox way, you're going to be like, wow, that makes my life a whole lot easier. All right, so another new concept as well, and this really isn't new when I talk about SAS. This is something that showed up about 10 years ago, in my opinion, uh, or at least off my memory. And SAS is, uh, it's an alternative way of writing CSS. So really, you're just writing CSS because you compile your SAS and it turns it to CSS. But the SAS way is like a more, it's an easier way of drilling down, especially when you start looking at specificity it also has CSS features like being able to use variables, and that's something that's new in CSS, but it does it's not supported on like older browsers like IE. But SAS allows you to use variables. So if you have styles that are reused like over and over again, it's common to put those in like a variable file and then just reference that variable so you don't have to go through and change something over and over again throughout your app. Also, in addition to that, how SAS is um, really compiled and intertwined into your modern day architecture. You don't have to use SAS. There's tools like Less. There's other libraries as well. But uh, Webpack is a common bundling tool. So these days, we're taking a bunch of CSS files, like written in SAS or something else, and we use Webpack to use another third-party tool to then compile that code and turn it to CSS, um, do things like minifying it, where, where we take out all the white space and all the comments out of the CSS to make it smaller. All those are commonly built into like what I would call a build system in your modern day web architecture and understanding how that all comes together is something that it, it takes some time. I have some courses on that as far as my CodeHawk website. So it's like, that's something though you definitely have to have at least a grasp of. How are we using CSS modules these days? How are they compiled? How are they loaded? Um, you know, the, the, all that stuff, it, it takes some time, but uh, there are plenty of tutorials out there to get you started. All right, so the next thing I think that you have to learn, and this is a new new kid on the block when it comes to CSS features, and that's CSS animations. If I refresh this page on W3Schools, you can see there's an animation going on. And before, we used to only be able to do that with JavaScript, and now we can actually do it with CSS, and we can actually have like things like keyframes. If you've ever done like video editing or tried to build your own cartoons, you know about keyframes, and it's very similar to any sort of like application where you deal with keyframes like Blender, 3ds Max, Adobe Flash Professional, or whatever it's called now. So another thing too, when it comes to debugging, there's there's common tools these days built inside the browser when it comes to uh, a Flexbox element. So if I were, to, or not Flexbox, but a CSS animation, if I were to go and highlight over this and I go to my 
uh, properties here and I want to go to more tools and then if I go to more tools I can go to just animations and that's for CSS animations so this is within Chrome I know you guys can't really see it that well but if I refresh it I now have these animations that are occurring down here in Chrome and Chrome I find is not nearly as helpful as far as the animations are concerned you can see this is just like it's just kind of buggy, really. Like, you can see it, the text animation, it kind of flicks off, and I just don't think it works very well. But if I look at this same thing inside of Mozilla, then I get, I think, much better debugging capabilities. And like I said, that's why there's give and take for both of these. I want to do a screenshot. If we inspect inside of here, and I look at animations here, you can see if I refresh, it's going to pick up on the animation has much better controls, gives me the ability to slide and, and debug my stuff a lot easier. So that's part of my point of saying, yeah, Mo Mozilla and Chrome are kind of both necessary for your modern day CSS development. All right, so one of the most common ones, and this is like, I think part of the standard syntax a bit, but maybe not really the standard syntax. I should have mentioned this one earlier, but this is one that is commonly overlooked. And if you don't really understand it, then you're not gonna understand why your CSS doesn't work for the most part. And that's all about the box model. And Chrome, you can see, has this built-in thing. It gives you every element that you select inside your elements panel. If you go all the way down to the bottom, it's gonna show you the box model. And that's gonna be all about your padding, your border, your margins, and then your position. Like, what is your, your display position? Is it absolute? Is it relative? Is it fixed? Understanding how all that stuff works uh, is absolutely imperative, and that really comes number two, I think, to the syntax. All right, guys, and then finally, I'll wrap up this video by saying uh, to master CSS, you then have to step into at least a popular library like Bootstrap. It's used all over the place. Understanding what Bootstrap is providing is going to be pretty imperative, but ultimately, understanding that these already built libraries of CSS code, if you know how to tap into them properly, it saves you a ton of time. All right, if you guys are just getting started learning code or maybe you guys have been coders and you're trying to learn some new information, I have a website, codehawk.com, like my name without the S, and it, there's all kinds of stuff here. So take a look at that if you guys are trying to learn programming. It's mostly web development, but there's, there's a lot of different types of courses.